So let me just state the theorem one more time. If xd is of complete metric space and f is a contraction, sorry, uh, yes, a contraction, not just norm decreasing, that's very important, um, then there exists a unique fixed point, and furthermore, given any x, any initial condition, the sequence x0, f of x0, f squared of x0, and so on, converges to that unique fixed point. So we're going to actually give the full proof of this theorem, which is actually not too complicated and illustrates a lot of uh, nice tricks that, are, that could be potentially useful in future applications. So the first claim is that, let me call this sequence x. So the first claim is that x is a Cauchy sequence. So the proof of the mini proof of 1, what do we have to do? As with any Cauchy sequence proof, fix epsilon. What we want to do is we want to find an integer n such that the distance between any two tail end members of the sequence sufficiently far out is less than epsilon. So remember, what's our goal? And this is, I should write this as a sketch. This is sort of thinking about the proof. And if you want to actually see the full proof, just check out the notes or the references. Um, the goal is to find a natural number n such that the distance between successive, and let's even call these, um, let's call this x1, let's call this x2, and so on, so that the nth iterate is subscript, um, has subscript n. So the distance between n and m is strictly less than epsilon for all n m greater than or equal to capital N. This is our goal. So how can we possibly do this? Well, let's do a side calculation and then see if we can extract out an integer n from it. The unfortunate thing is that this sequence, this uh, Cauchy condition, depends on two inputs, the variables n and m. And if we want to find a single n, then we should somehow get rid of the dependence on one of these variables. So notice, let me rewrite this in a fashion um, so that I can work from memory here. Uh, the distance between xm and xn, so that m is less than, um, so without loss of generality, assume m is less than or equal to n or even less than, because if it's equal to, then, um, then that's zero. But anyway, so let's calculate this distance and apply the triangle inequality several times. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this out as the distance between. So what I want to do here is I want to get m and n right next to each other. So as at the moment, n could be significantly far away from m. So what I want to do is apply the triangle inequality several times. So here, let me draw like a sequence. And if m here, uh, if xm is somewhere here and xn is somewhere far out in the sequence, what I want to do is I want to throw in these extra points and then have a nice calculation that describes the distance between two successive points. And the reason for that is because we can use our contraction assumption, which says that the distance between f of x comma f of y is less than or equal to the distance between x and y uh, multiplied by some strictly less than one factor. So what we're going to do is we're going to input a bunch of things here. So we're going to write xm comma xm plus 1 plus dxm plus 1 comma xn. So now we've added in this extra point right here. So let me write that xm plus 1. 
And what we want to do is we want to keep doing this and add all of these numbers, xm plus 2, add all of these points in the sequence, xm plus 3, and so on, up until we reach xn. So applying the triangle inequality multiple times, we get the following sequence, d x n minus i comma x n plus 1 minus i and this sequence runs from 1 to n minus m. Let's just check to make sure that this works. When i equals 1, these two cancel and I get x n and here I get x n minus 1. So that's this point over here. Then the next term is x n plus uh, x n minus 1 on the right, and then xn minus 2 here. So I'm going over this way. And then all the way up to n minus m, when, when i equals n minus m, I get xm comma xm plus 1. So this indeed works. And now what we're going to do is, since these are adjacent to each other, I can re-express this using f by definition of this sequence. So this is literally equal to because I'm just substituting the definition of f and our sequence. Applying f, n minus i, and so that it's the same on both sides, minus, so plus um, n minus i times. To the point x0. And here I have n minus i as well, but here it's applied to the point x1. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the contraction condition here. And the contraction condition pulls out a factor of alpha to the n minus ith power. And then it's the distance from x0 to x1. And this sum is still the same. And now if you notice, this distance doesn't depend on i anymore. So I can pull it out of this sum. So I can rewrite that as equaling to distance x0, x1 sum of alpha to the n minus ith power starting at 1. Let's just write this out so that we see what this looks like. This is d x0, x1. And the first few terms look like so if I read this, if I read this backwards, the lowest number is actually alpha to the mth power. And then the next number, they're all increasing. So this is alpha to the m plus first, plus dot dot dot, plus alpha to the n minus first power. And then we can pull out that alpha to the mth power. And we get d x naught x1 times, now it's 1 plus alpha plus alpha squared plus so on up until alpha to the n minus 1 minus m power. Now alpha is all positive, or at least not negative. So I can replace this with the infinite series by adding up all of these successive terms. And what that's going to do is that's going to get rid of the dependence on n. So notice here I have an m left over. And now that I have some natural number left over, hopefully we'll be able to solve for capital N in terms of epsilon. So this becomes alpha to the mth, d x naught x1, the infinite sum of, let's call it k equals 0, alpha to the kth power. And this is just a geometric series. And this equals 1 over 1 minus alpha. So this is, this is equal to, at this point, and this is also, by the way, a strictly, uh, strictly less than, um, provided that alpha is not 0. So we get alpha to the mth power, the distance between the first two points in the iteration, 1 minus alpha. And our goal was that this is strictly less than epsilon. So all we have to do is solve for m 
in terms of this epsilon. And if we do that, we'll get alpha to the mth, let's see, is less than epsilon 1 minus alpha. Divide the distance. Now, why can we divide by the distance? If the distance between x0 and x1 was 0, then we would have found our fixed point, and we wouldn't have had to even do this entire procedure. So it suffices to assume that if x was not equal to x1, then this distance is non-zero. So then we can solve for m, and m is going to be, by applying the logarithm with base a, sorry, with base alpha, this is log base alpha, epsilon 1 minus alpha over the distance between x0 and x1. And I definitely messed up somewhere here. So let's see um, what that is. Right, and I messed up here because notice that alpha is strictly less than 1, and m is, so alpha to the mth power is always even smaller and smaller. So when I take the logarithm of both sides, this is going to be a negative number. So I'm going to get log on this side equals log on that side, but that's a negative number, so I have to actually reverse this um, uh, inequality. And what I get is that this equation is going to hold true provided that I choose some natural number n that is greater than the log of alpha of this expression. So fix some natural number greater than this for that given epsilon, so it depends on epsilon just to make that clear, and then when you go through this calculation, you'll see that the distance between xn and xm is always strictly less than epsilon for all n and m greater than or equal to this natural number right here. So this shows that x is Cauchy. And there are still two other parts of this theorem. So this just shows that x is Cauchy, and because x is complete, every Cauchy sequence converges, so we know that this sequence converges to something. So the claim 2 is that f of the limit of this sequence is equal to the limit of this sequence. In other words, this sequence converges to a fixed point. So why is that? f is continuous, so the limit of f applied to a sequence that converges is equal to the limit of each of these constituents. So let me write the n here so that it's clear. fxn. But we know by definition what xn is. This is just xn plus 1. And we already know that this sequence converges. This sequence converges to lim x. So it's sort of an easy uh, proof now that to prove that this uh, converged, this sequence converges to a fixed point. So claim three is uniqueness. There's a unique fixed point. And to see this, assume, suppose by contradiction, that y is another fixed point, so in particular it's distinct from this one. And what we can do is we can calculate the distance between y and x. And because they're distinct, that distance has to be positive. So the distance between lim x, on the one hand, on the one hand it has to be positive. Let me write that this way. And on the other hand, since these are both fixed points, I can apply f here. Right? So Fy. But F is a contraction. So I know that this says, uh, by the way, I forgot to mention this, but alpha, this the alpha that I've been using here is uh, coming from the contraction. Um, so then this is less than or equal to alpha, the distance from lim x to y. 
And because alpha is strictly less than 1, and these two points are distinct, this is strictly less than d lim x, comma y. So what we've found was a number that is strictly less than or equal to itself. Actually, I didn't really need that zero here. The contradiction comes from the fact that you're taking, the dis you're taking a number and it's less than or equal to itself. That doesn't make sense. So this is a contradiction. And the theorem was proved.